Amen. Good to be here. Good to have everybody with us. If I uh, have anybody visiting first time, make yourself at home. We are glad to have you. Amen. Good to be here. Good to have Lonnie back. Says so good to get your car fixed. Said I had to get me another one. Getting fixed. They wore out. <laughs> well, we're glad. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know how it is. Anything made by man has a has a has a short lifespan. you made it all right. Uh, remember Monica Pierce, please. We had her, we went by and saw her last night and uh, her mother just passed away and they had the funeral today. Uh, she loved her mother. Her mother's only 63 years old and she had this plague and passed away from it and uh, 63. And uh, Monica is a very uh, precious lady. You got three beautiful little children. So please pray for her pray for please uh, I just found out about Lois Weiser she had open-heart surgery today uh, I think a double or triple bypass she's in ICU right now and the doctor's very happy with what he did apparently it was okay it went well but she's going to be in ICU now for about uh, 24 hours or so I think and be there for four days she said that they said that this next 24 hours is the most critical when you have open-heart surgery so please keep uh, please keep her in prayer Lois Weiser I haven't been able to talk to uh, uh, our sister over here that had the knee replacement, uh, Sheila, Sheila McMahon. Yeah, I haven't been able to get a hold of her yet, but uh, I hope, does anybody know that? Yes. They don't care how much you scream and whine and carry on. They're going to make you do what they, what they want you to do. But that's good. That's a good thing. You need to do it. Uh, so please keep them in prayer. John Maples, keep, please keep praying for John Maples. Uh, it's good to have Patsy back. Amen. You decided to come back to him. Is that right? Amen. Okay. Well, we're glad to have you back. Amen. Do we have any other prayer requests tonight before we pray? Yes, ma'am. Amen, amen. God is still able to raise him up and, and give him his, uh, and, and he'll be able to do what the doctors say he can't do because I've seen that happen. So don't give up hope. Appreciate what the doctors say, but that's not the last word. So pray for him. All right, anybody else? Yes. All right, brother. Amen. Okay. Okay. Amen. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. His mother is losing her own children. That's, that's rough stuff. But when you live to be 100, uh, I'm sure that's not unusual. All right, anybody else? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, amen. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. depressed people right now. All right, anybody else? All right, I've spoken a quest tonight. All right, let's come up here and have an altar prayer tonight, folks. I'm going to ask Brother John Beck if you'll please lead us in prayer. We've got some serious, serious prayer. Father, I won't, I won't deny that, but Father, 
My hope's in you. My hope's not in politicians. My hope's not in the things that man can do. My hope is only in you, dear Father, because I know that you're all-powerful. And, Lord, it might be your will that things might change. But if not, Father, Lord, we trust you. We thank you. Dear God, you've been so good to us. Father, I just want to thank you for your mercy. I just want to thank you for your love. And, Lord, I just thank you for all that you do in our lives. Lord, we don't deserve it. Father, we deserve hell. And I just pray, Father, that you just continue to, to be good to us, Lord, as you always have been. And, Father, I pray that you help us to be thankful. So many times, Father, we, we're unthankful. And I just ask, Lord, that you would just help us to, to thank you in all things, to give you praise and glory because you are worthy, Lord. Lord, I just thank you so much for what you've done in my life. I thank you, Lord, for... Lord, you just poured out blessings upon me, Father, and I don't even deserve it. Lord, I just want to thank you for that. I want to praise your holy name, Lord, that I'm saved. And, and Lord, I just ask that you would just continue to work in our midst and our presence. Father, we invite you tonight to just minister to our hearts through the word. I pray that you'd be with our dear pastor as he opens the word of life. And, and Father, as he expounds what you've placed on his heart to teach tonight, Lord, that you would just help us to hide it in our heart that we might not sin against you. And Father, that you would convict us, that you would challenge us, Lord. Lord, we need something from you tonight. Lord, help us, Father, Lord, to, to have our hearts and minds ready. And, Lord, that we'd be able to leave here saying that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we just pray that your will would be done in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 1 with me tonight, please. Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. The Apostle Luke takes off here in chapter 1, verse 1, the former treatise. A treatise is a book. Uh, you've heard them called tomes or a treatise. It's a book. Have I made, O Theophilus, that's the lover of God, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Father, bless your holy word now and the messenger tonight. Give me unction. In thy name I pray. Amen. The book of Acts starts with 12 replacing Judas Iscariot. And so they cast lots for it, and he was replaced. It starts with the Lord Jesus Christ ascending back to heaven, and he ascends back to heaven in virtue of his own righteousness. He leaves from the Mount of Olives. When I was in the Holy Land one time, I'll never forget, when we got to the Mount of Olives, there was a Byzantine church. The Byzantines built on spots all over the Holy Land that they figured would be the place, here in particular, where Christ left the earth, where he ascended. I can't be absolutely certain, but they built a church right there, right on the spot where they thought that he ascended. But standing right outside the door was a man with his hand out, and he was begging. And he was a Muslim. And I thought to myself, what a thing, what a contrast. Here you have the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ leaving this earth, a victor. He left as a victor. And, he, and here's a man standing and doesn't have a clue of the richness that's in that building and uh, of what Christ is able to do for us. And he, of course, can give us riches that cannot be taken from us. He said, don't lay up yourself riches here on this earth, but put them up in heaven. And so it was. But in verse number 8 it says, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The word translated power here is dunamis. Dunamis, and they get the English word dynamite from it. But you've got to be awful careful now, thinking that the power he's talking about here is like something that explodes. There's a whole lot more going on than that. It really, literally has to do with an all-encompassing ability and authority that comes upon the individual because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you that, he said. You'll no longer be afraid. You won't run from anybody. And you'll have authority when you speak. And there'll be power in your ministry. And you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so here in the book of Acts 1, he said, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. You'll notice that the witness starts locally in Jerusalem and spreads out. This, of course, is an apostolic. This is, a, this is an evangelistic call to go out and carry the word of God to a lost and dying world. As this sister said tonight, people are struggling in darkness. 
All, uh, so many things tonight that they put their trust in is crumbling before their very eyes. And they say that, that, uh, that Christian ministries, that people are flocking to them online and on the radio and television and in the church house because they're seeking something now. Their foundations have been destroyed. The thing they put their trust in is coming apart. Well, no better foundation can any man lay than is laid. And that foundation is not silver and gold. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who built your house upon him. You'll never fall. You may, see the, you may see the culture around you fall, and I think you may see a profound change take place in it. It may be passed from one political party to the other, but that is not going to change the church of God. And that's one of the themes that I'll be talking about in the message tonight, how that even in the face of persecution and trouble, the church prospered. It did not die. It prospered. And that's exactly why, because he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say I'd build his church. He didn't say you'd build his church. And I'm afraid an awful lot of preachers and ministers got the idea it's up to them to build it. No, sir. We need to be faithful ministers of the word. He'll build it. And that's exactly what he said. So in verse 9, it says he was taken up, and they watched him as he left. It wasn't a spirit taken up before them, some phantom that could, that could return, and you would not see a visible return, and, he, and people could say, he's come back, and here he is. No, he went away physically, he'll come again physically, and you'll see him appear. In, verse, in chapter number 2 and verse number 1, though, look at this carefully. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. He promised them now, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Here we have Pentecost. Pentecost, Pentes, five or 50. Pentecost is the 50th day from Passover. And Passover was the, num was the beginning. That's when it started. In the Old Testament, he said, this is the beginning of months. So Passover, Passover was the start. 50 days later is Pentecost. It's also called the Feast of Weeks. And it's the feast of, of, of the ingathering, you know, the coming, the, the gathering of the main harvest. And it's, uh, and it's important to understand what's going on here because this is what's happening. The Holy Ghost is being poured out upon believers. And after this, they get saved with tens of thousands, not just one or two. Tens of thousands are being added to the church. And so it represents this blessing, this over, overabundant blessing that God gave to the church when it started. It didn't stop them from persecuting it. But let me tell you something again. You're not going to, you're not going to stomp his church out. Amen. You're not going to kill it. No, 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 no. If you, a lot of thought they would down through the years. Not going to happen. My faith is not in the government. And it is not in a political party. My faith is in Christ tonight. And he's never failed me. Amen. And he'll never be voted out of office. Because huh. he's not running for office. He's the Lord God Almighty. But note carefully, on Pentecost is the 50th day from Passover, which is the beginning day. Seven months later, on the seventh month, the tenth day of the month is Yom Kippur. That's called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is the day when the high priest goes into the temple and, and there he goes before the, before, the, before the altar of God inside the Holy of Holies and he communes with God and offers a sacrifice that's been offered. He takes that blood and sprinkles that blood upon the mercy seat. He goes before God. Then he comes back out and the people are waiting outside for the priest to appear, high priest. And when he appears, he blesses them. He blesses them with the blessing that he has received because he was in the Holy of Holies. And so the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ will appear the second time without sin into salvation for those that look for his appearing. So if you belong to an apostate church, get ready to stay here. You're not going anywhere. You're going into the tribulation. That's why so many people today are preaching about the church is going to be in the tribulation, going to the tribulation. I understand why. Because for the most part, the church in this country is of no consequence whatsoever for what happens. It's dead, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. So where does our power come from? Holy Ghost power. It comes from the Holy Spirit. But here's what happens. This seventh day, tenth day of the month, the Day of Atonement, is when the Muslims attacked Israel on Yom Kippur. They were in their synagogues, and they were worshiping God. 
And so the Muslims attacked them on that day in 1973, and that was one time in Israel's history when they almost lost it. But God intervened. He, got, he intervened. We had a president in the White House who came to Israel's aid, and his name was Richard Nixon. And God intervened in that Day of Atonement, and he intervened on the behalf of Israel. And even though the Muslims tried to destroy them and drive them into the sea, the Almighty gave them a victory. It took them a while to get it all together, but he gave them a victory. And here's what they said after that. The Jews said, we will never, we will never allow ourselves to be caught off guard like we were on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement. So what are they doing? They're looking for the one to come. They're looking for the Mashiach. They're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for him to come. They're praying for him to come. And he's going to come. But are they going to be surprised when they see who it is? They're going to see the nail prints in his hands and say, where'd you get that? He said, I got it in the house of my friends. And they're going to mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. They're going to say to each other, well, he's ours. He was ours. Well, he was here. That's what the Talmud is talking about. Now, right after that is the Feast of Tabernacles. And Sukkoth is the Hebrew word for it. They build little sheds out of, uh, out of twigs and so forth, and they gather together in them, and they stay in there for a while. And the purpose is for them to remember that they had been slaves in Egypt and had been delivered from it. But now look at it dispensationally. Here's Passover. That's the beginning of it, the cross at Calvary. Fifty days later is the main harvest. That was 2,000 two years ago at Pentecost. That's when the main harvest started. And then the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, is the gleanings. It is the finishing up. It is what may be left of the harvest, and that's where we are right now. We're at the end. We're not in the main harvest. We're at the end, and he's just about ready to come back. I don't know when he's coming. I'll tell you this, 2021 would be a good year. It'd be a mighty good year. Because so far, 2021 hasn't started out real good, has it? It hadn't excited me one bit. It's just like 2020 and 2021 may be 2020 on steroids. Who knows? But I don't think it's going to get any better. So the Bible says in Acts chapter number 2 over here and verse number, verse number 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heavens, a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it set, set upon each of them. These cloven tongues represented the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it was letting them know you're going to have something to say from now on. And when you say it, you're going to say it with power, for you shall receive power, dunamis. You're going to receive that authority, that confidence. That's what that word means. That, you are, that, that God has given you, given you something. He's given you a commission. And now he's going to give you the authority and the power to do it and to say it. And if you'll notice in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 3, it says, And they spoke, uh, they, there appeared cloven tongues, and they all filled the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What other tongues? It tells you plainly in verse number 6. Acts chapter number 2 and verse 6, here's what it says about the other tongues. It says, And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They couldn't make sense of it. it. It amazed them because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Isn't it amazing, folks, how that God sent a dispersion of the language at the Tower of Babel? That's where all the languages started. Before that, everybody spoke in the same language. He dispersed them. But then he turned right around and used all those dispersed languages to bring them together again. Isn't that amazing? God can do anything. And so they, every man heard in his own language the marvelous works of God. For whatever my dear brethren Pentecostal, and a lot of those folks I love dearly, and they're good people. But when they come along and tell me that Acts chapter number 2 supports what they do, no, sir. You are, no, 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 no. You cannot use Acts 2. Acts 2 is dealing with a language. A discernible language. 16 different languages there without question. But look at chapter number 4 and verse 1. I want to move through this because you need to understand the context of how all this happened. Acts 4 verse 1. 
And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached to Jesus the resurrection from the dead, laid hands on them and put them in hold till the next day, for it was now eventide. They've always been the enemies of the gospel of Christ. So they locked them up. This is persecution. They're grieving. These, these people are being persecuted. You've got to remember this. The church was born in persecution. It did not start as a state religion. It was despised. People literally loathed people of that way. And at this time, right here in Acts chapter number 4, they were called people of the way, the people of this way. And when, 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 when Paul went to Damascus, he was looking for any of that way. It was later somewhere, was it, where they called them Christians? Antioch, Antioch of Syria. They were called Christians. The Christians didn't call themselves Christians. They were called Christians by their enemies. It was, a, it, was, it was a slur, a slide upon them to be called a Christians. They thought that by calling them Christians, they'd be ashamed, and hide. And they said, no, we'll bear that name and enjoy. We'll, we'll rejoice. It means Christ-like. And so you can call me a Christian anytime you want to. You ain't going to make me mad because that's what I am. I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the world called them Christians. Chapter number 5 and verse number 26, they're arrested again. All kinds of problems. Chapter 5, 26. When the captain with the officers brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. When they'd brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, And did we not straightly command you not to teach or not to preach in that name? Look at verse number 40. Look at verse number 40, Acts chapter number 5 and verse 40. And so we have Gamaliel, verse number 37. He was a wise man, and he shows up, Gamaliel does, He's, uh, chapter, verse 34 rather. Gamaliel shows up and tells them plainly, you don't have any wisdom or sense at all. If this is of God, don't worry. If don't, you can't stop it. But if it's not of God, say it's a fad, or they're following another one of the many, 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 listen folks, they don't want you to know this, <laughs> but this is a fact. The Jews have followed all kinds of messiahs off here and messiahs off there and messiahs off here. All kinds, Bar Kokhba in 135 AD was one of those messiahs. They even struck coins with his picture on it. See, Bar Kokhba caused them to rise up in 70 AD against their Roman oppressors. And what happened? No, not, not 70, 135 A.D. What happened against Hadrian? And so what happened? Hadrian came in there. He crucified the Jews. He changed the name of Jerusalem to Aliyah Capitolina. He, he killed a pig, a swine, and offered it on the altar to God, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did hundreds of years before him. And Hadrian, Hadrian built a Cardo Maximus right down the center of Jerusalem, and you can go underneath the ground in Jerusalem, and you can see the Cardo Maximus. He was turning it into a Roman city. So therefore, he called it Alia Capitolina and changed the name of it to Palestine, Palestina, Palestine. He did that because the Palestinians were the ancient Philistines. It was after the Philistine. The Philistines were the ancient enemy of Israel. So he thought, I'll do this. I'll change the name of this country from Israel to Palestine, and that's where it started. It started from with, with Hadrian in 135 AD, and so they did. They changed the name of it, and he drove them from their country, and he crucified them all over the place, they say by the tens of thousands, and horrible things that they did to the Jews, and they were crucified, and they were driven from their land, and now, my dear friend, they're trying to come back to their land. They're making what's called Aliyah, and an Aliyah is coming back to Israel, and to the land that God gave Abraham in Genesis 15. And they're coming back to that land. And they have to deal with the Philistine. The Philistine. They have to deal with the Philistine. And so they have to deal with that. You say, what's going to happen? That's in the future. And I think it's soon. There's going to be a peace made. And the president right now has done more to bring about peace than anybody that's ever been in that office. 
He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's what the Lord Jesus said. Here's what he meant by that. You're hearing the sound as it goes forth. Everybody in here has ears. But everybody in here does not have ears that can hear. That's the blessing from God. Thank God if he gives you ears to hear and eyes that can see. And that's where we are. Hope you have that. If you don't pray for it, God will give it to you. So they were arrested in chapter number 5 and verse number 40. And they, to them they agreed. And when they had called the apostles, beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now watch this. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. <laughs> That's heavy duty stuff right there, folks. That's the kind of people that he built his church with. They rejoiced because they were chosen to suffer for the name of Christ. Look at chapter number 7, verse number 58. I'm going to give you just a little bit of the persecution. Chapter number 7, verse 58. And they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Who'd they, who'd they stone? Who's being stoned here? Stephen. Stephanos. Stephen is being stoned to death. For what? His faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter number 8 and verse number 3, we read, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. You talk about a persecutor. He was personal about it. He hated Christians. As far as Saul was concerned, this was a cult. This was, a, this was a cult and an offshoot of Judaism, and he wanted to wipe it from the face of the earth. He wanted to do away with it. Get it out. It's, it deserves you. If you believe that, you deserve to die. That's what Mao Zedong believed. That's what Stalin believed. That's what Hitler believed. You deserve to die. You don't deserve to live. People right now have been calling for executions in what's been happening in the country. I wonder what they'd do if a shooting war broke out. I hope not. I hope not. I heard a man say one time, he said, if we can't settle our differences with a ballot box, then we go to the bullet box. I hope that doesn't happen, folks. We've done been through one civil war in this country. There's a bunch of hotheads out there that like to do it, though. I read their stuff, and they say, bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. There's, there's, war is a living hell on this earth. You want no part of war. No part of it. But there may be a situation where you can't stop it. It may come. So Stephen Stone, Saul persecutes them. Look at chapter number 12 and verse number 1. Acts 12 and verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Now imagine what this was like. Who were the three that went with the Lord Jesus to the top of the Mount of uh, Transfiguration? That's this James. Who were the three that went to, with him to the Garden of Gethsemane? And he said, pray with me for a while. Who was it? Exactly. They were in the inner circle. All right. The inner circle. The disciples closest to the Lord Jesus. And yet one of them gets killed. Now, don't you see something here? He killed him. Now, of course, Herod's a politician, verse 3. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he pursued it further to take Peter also. The only thing he was concerned about was pleasing the Jews. That's all. His man has no morals. He has no conscience. He has no soul. He wants to please the Jews. And if he sees it, does it, he'll do it. Now, look at chapter number, uh, chapter number uh, 12 and verse number 5. Acts 12, 5. Now, we've just had James killed by the sword. He's been, been murdered. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church and to God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth and given him the same thing that happened to James, the same night Peter was sleeping between two so shoulder, soldiers. He's really worried about dying or anything else, wasn't he? Bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. 
and a light shined in the prison. I can't imagine what that looked like. And he smote Peter on the side and raised, get up, wake up. And raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off from him. Now, this is amazing. And the angel said to him, gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And when they went out, followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened of its own accord. <laughs> now here's the point. He let James die, but he saved Peter. This is one of those things that has to do with the sovereignty of God. He allows one to die, but he heals another. Nobody can give you the reason for that. Nobody can read the mind of God. He said, as the rain cometh down, the snow from heaven, and watereth the earth, bring, bring, that it may bring forth in bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. In that same context, he says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts, my ways, above your ways. We can't see far. We look through a glass darkly. We don't understand. There are things happen that there are no explanations for. But what I have to do, and I think what we all have to do, is just get a little closer to the Lord and take hold of him and say, God, we can't live without you now. We can't live without you. We have to have you. To whom shall we go? Peter said, thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, I say again to you tonight, where can we go? Where are you going to go? You sure not going to run to the government. They're not going to save you. Run off to some religion somewhere. That's not going to save you. Get yourself drunk and stay drunk the rest of your life. That's not going to do you any good. So where are you going to go? You're going to go to the Lord Jesus. That's where you're going to go. You're going to go to the one where it all started. That's our only strength, our only hope. If we didn't have him tonight, we wouldn't have any more than anybody else has out here. We wouldn't. But we have him. And now as Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You know good and well that it bothered them because Steve, that James died. Because James was one of the inner circle. He was important. He was an apostle. He was one of the 12. Yes, sir. John's brother James killed with a sword. I'm sure it sent shock waves through the church when that happened. How could God let something like that happen? And then, of course, they took Peter. What does it say about the church? What did they do when Peter was locked up? They what now? They, without ceasing. They sure did. I mean, they got into a serious prayer meeting. They really did. And that's what happened. They got into a prayer meeting. They prayed and sought the face of God. Let God make the final call, folks. I can't do it. There are people in this world that are near and dear to me. And those of you out here in this auditorium, do you have anybody near and dear to you? Would it be hard to give them up? Why, well, certainly. Certainly, even though you know where they're going is such a wonderful place, absent from the body, present with the Lord, especially if you see your loved ones suffer. You see them suffer cancer or other things that they suffer from. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But even at that, it's hard to give them up. It's hard to give them up. Well, remember this tonight. You just loan them to the Lord. And that's one more waiting for you when you get to heaven. And one more to give you a hug. One more and kiss you. And you kiss them as you approach the throne of God. Let me tell you something. If we didn't have the Lord, and we didn't have this Bible right here, there really would be no reason for you to keep your sanity. Amen. Because there's no explanation for anything else. But the book is quite a thing. The book, this is a book, this is something. <laughs> it really is. That book is something else. And that book was not written to make you a Baptist. <laughs> no, it wasn't written to make you a Catholic or a Presbyterian. That book was written that you might know God. Amen. These things are written, John said, that you might know him. Amen. Thank you, John. <laughs> God bless you. Father, bless your word now. In the holy name, amen. Josh, he's going to sing for us tonight.
I had a different song picked out uh, that I was going to sing, but the Lord just kept bringing me back to this song, <clears throat> especially after what has went down today with everything going on <clears throat> here in America. And uh, I love that, that. That was actually one of the verses that you just talked about was the church praying without ceasing because uh, this song, A Wall of Prayer, uh, is truly, I believe, what we really need right now as Christians. <clears throat> so just pray for me. There are walls made by man, built by frail and human hands, that an enemy can scale. There's one protecting me from my greatest enemy. It's a wall that Satan can't break through. Sometimes a wall of grace, sometimes a wall of faith, other times it's sweet mercy that I need. But the one for which I long, it makes all the other strong. I need a wall of prayer surrounding me. Oh, my brother, when I'm weak, would you stay fortress round me strong that can't be moved and I promise you today when I bow my knees to pray I'll do my best to build a wall of prayer for you sometimes times it's sweet mercy that I need but the one for which I long it makes all the other strong I need a wall of prayer surrounding me but the one for which I makes all the other strong. I need a wall of prayer surrounding me. That was good, Josh. That was good. <laughs> That's a good song, too, don't you think? It ought to encourage us to start praying. If you're not, get back in there. Call upon the Lord. Go back to your prayer life. You need to pray. You pray every day of your life. You need to be praying. Uh, pray without ceasing, he said. You can preach too much. You can sing too much. You can run too much. You can do everything too much. But you cannot pray too much. Right. Amen. All right. Let's stand up and we'll have a word of prayer and let you go. Thank you, Lord, for this time we have together. You know how dark it is outside. You know how things are coming apart. Our Father, we watch these things happen in our country. And Lord, it causes a lot of strife, a lot of strife in people tonight. They're not happy about this, and I understand why. But Father, I know this. I know nothing's changed with you. You're eternal, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never, ever, ever will you come crumbling down. We ask it in Jesus' name. Bless my brothers and sisters. Keep them safe. In thy name I pray, amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. We'll see you Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. <clears throat>